Welcome. In this segment, we're going to learn about the case control study design. A good way to remember the case control study design is actually the name itself. With the case control study design, we start off with cases and controls, and then we look back in time to see what the exposures were. So let's delve in. After completing this segment, you should be able to complete the following learning objectives. List the basic characteristics of case control studies and identify the advantages and disadvantages of case control studies. Let's review the types of study design briefly before we go forward in discussing case control studies. This is a more in-depth graphic showing the study design types for both experimental and observational studies. Now just to remind you, experimental designs include randomized control trials and crossover clinical trials. Basic observational study designs include cohort, case control, cross-sectional, and ecologic. The choice of study design to address a specific research question will be driven by the nature of the disease or health outcome being studied, the exposure of interest, and cost, time, and feasibility issues. Let's now discuss case control studies in more depth. Case control studies are an efficient and common epidemiologic study design to study rare diseases. The rule of thumb that we will be using for this MOOC is rare is defined as a prevalence of less than 10%. In a case control study, researchers begin by selecting diseased individuals or individuals with the health outcome of interest. These are known as cases. Researchers also select a group of individuals without the disease, known as controls. In contrast to the cohort study design we learned about in the previous segment, in case control studies, subjects are selected for study because they either have the disease of interest, i.e. a case, or they do not, i.e. they're the control. Case control studies proceed logistically from effect, i.e. the disease or health outcome, to the cause, the exposure of interest, as the researchers look back in time to see what the exposure was in both the case group and the control group. There are three key steps in conducting a case control study. Step one, first you define and select the cases. Cases are selected from a group that has the disease or health outcome of interest. The next step is step two, define and select the controls. Controls are the non-cases that are representative of the same source population that gives rise to the cases. Step three is, then we measure and compare the exposure prevalence in the controls versus the cases. Let's discuss case selection in more detail. Researchers first determine the diagnostic criteria they will use to define a case. For example, if studying Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever, which is a tick-borne disease, the diagnostic definition of the disease should be clearly specified in order to classify people as cases or controls. In defining cases of Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever, the diagnostic criteria should include the following symptoms. Symptoms include fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. A very large proportion of cases also have a rash within 2 to 14 days of a tick bite, so you could include that symptom. Or as a researcher, you could decide to not include rash as a symptom and make your definition slightly broader. Even though ca study cases should be representative of all cases, it is not necessary to enroll every case of the disease in your study. You may end up with a sample of cases that meet your diagnostic criteria from a specific population, such as a hospital, clinic, or other resource. The type of case you select is also important. It is better to use incident cases rather than prevalent cases. Prevalent cases are influenced by the duration of the disease. In the next slides, we will learn how to select controls for a study. When selecting controls for a study, researchers may include multiple controls per case or multiple control groups. Multiple controls per case can be used to help add statistical power when cases are unduly difficult to obtain. Statistical power refers to the size of your study and your ability to detect an association should one exist. Sometimes researchers use more than one control group to see if the relationships they find are consistent across control groups. Consistency across control groups gives more credibility to the results. Now that we have discussed selection of cases and controls, we will consider how to compare exposure prevalence. Recall that the total number of exposed persons in a case control study is not the same as the total number of exposed persons in the source population. 
The same is true about the number of non-exposed in a case control study. Thus, the denominators obtained in a case control study do not represent the total number of exposed and non-exposed persons in the source population. The investigators arbitrarily decide how many controls will be selected to compare with the cases. The consequence of this arbitrary selection is that we cannot measure risks or rates in a case control study directly because the population at risk, the denominator, is not ascertained. Instead, we use a measure called an odds ratio. The odds ratio is simply the odds of exposure for cases divided by the odds of exposure for controls. The odds ratio represents the strength of an association between exposure and outcome. Let's examine the pros and cons or advantages and disadvantages of a cohort study versus a case control study. Consider a hypothetical study designed to learn whether pesticide exposure increases the risk of breast cancer. Imagine a prospective cohort of 89,949 women ages 34 to 59 who are avid gardeners. Blood samples are taken from all 89,000 women at the beginning of follow-up and then they were frozen. These samples were used to determine pesticide levels present in the blood. Over eight years of follow-up, 1,439 breast cancer cases were identified. What would these data look like if we were doing a cohort study? Here's our cohort study data, which would be great. But, well, what's the problem with our cohort study? Quantifying pesticide levels in the blood is very expensive. It's not practical to analyze all 89,949 blood samples. To be efficient, analyze blood on all cases, 1,439, but only analyze blood from a small sample of the women who did not get breast cancer, say two times as many cases, or 2,878. Now let's imagine that these data were used instead for a case control study. Recall that to be efficient, the researchers should analyze all blood from the cases, n equals 1,439, but just take a sample of the women who did not get breast cancer, say two times as many cases, or n equals 2,878. These data can be used to estimate the risk ratio or rate ratio depending on how we sample the controls. Remember, the investigator selects the study population from the source population, and the study population is divided into participants and non-participants. The case group and the control groups are chosen from the study participants. Therefore, the total number of exposed person in a case control study is not the same as the total number of exposed person in the source population. The same holds true for the controls, or non-exposed, in a case control study. Thus, the denominators obtained in a case control study do not represent the total number of exposed and non-exposed persons in the source population. So where do you get the denominator? The denominator is the number of controls. We can use this information to create a 2 by 2 table to help determine the odds ratio. Let's review when it is best to use a case control study. Case control studies are best when the disease is rare, for example, studying risk factors for birth defects, or when exposure data are expensive or difficult to obtain, like our example with the pesticides, so the lab tests for the pesticides in the blood. Case control studies are also useful to use when the disease has a long induction and latent period, for example, cancer or cardiovascular disease. And lastly, these are useful for when uh, little is known about this disease, for example, the studies of AIDS um, early when um, the AIDS epidemic began. Now we will discuss the underlying source population for a case control study. The case population does not have to consist of all cases in a potential source population, but can be restricted to a specific age range, sex, race, or socioeconomic status. For example, the majority of the U.S. may be a source population for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, but for a specific study, the researcher may restrict the case population to be adults ages 18 to 35 in North Carolina. Population controls can be obtained by probability sampling of the source population if the latter can be defined. Probability sampling can be done by sampling from a complete census, by random digit dialing, or by having a roster of all members of the source population, i.e. 
or, for example, union members, members of a professional association, or voter registration lists if registration is mandatory, etc. Controls should represent the restricted source population from which cases arise, not all non-cases in the total population. That's an important point to remember. Now, let's move on to discuss matching in case control studies. We match to make sure that controls and cases are similar in variables which may be related to the outcome we are studying. Matching means that for every case, there is at least one control who has the same or similar values of the matching variable. Matching may be by sex, age, race or ethnic group, etc. Sometimes there is more than one control per case. Matching should be limited to one or more important and strong risk factors. Otherwise, it will be difficult to obtain matches for cases. Weak risk factors are not worth considering for matching. They can be easily evaluated if they are simply measured and considered in the statistical analysis. Matching on a variable prevents evaluating the effects of the match variable, since this variable would be equal or similar between cases and controls. This concludes the segment on case control studies. The important thing to remember about a case control study, that if it's done appropriately with uh, the right kind of sampling, the information that we determine from a case control study can really mirror what can be found from a cohort study, but with a, a great deal less cost and a lot less time. So advantages include that, one, it's the most efficient design for rare diseases, case control studies are good for rare outcomes, it takes less time, it also uses fewer resources and money, and you can examine multiple exposures, it's likely to be replicable in other populations. If sampled accurately, odds ratios provide an estimate of the risk or rate ratios. Disadvantages include that there might be some possible biases in the selection of the subjects, measurement of the exposure, or the analyses. Also, a case control study uh, does not provide a direct estimate for the risk or rate ratio. Also, they are not good for rare exposures. The time sequence between exposure and outcome is uncertain.